This is part two of the coverage of the AR Online 20th Anniversary Day at the Gaydon British Motor Museum and we're going to continue where we left off with a question and answer session with some of the men from the British Leyland Austin Rover Company. Mike's fixed these cars, Mike's sold these cars and uh, one day I got this email from, from a random, I get lots of emails from random and, and basically he, he sent me a picture of this Rover 214 SI or SLI, SLI, SLI. Yeah. he basically bought it for 100 quid, it had been dragged out of a hedge, it looked, it looked like, um, well it looked like me after a particularly bad press week <laughs> and um, <laughs> That's how it looked when he got it, but by the time he'd finished with it, it you know, it looked and it smelled. It was really knackered. Yeah. <laughs> it looked and smelled like a new car. And and Mike, what really switched me on to Mike was just the comedy, the, the, the joy in his writing. He's such a great writer and he's such an asset to have on the team. And uh, you know, I couldn't have done it without him. So, you know, I'd say put your hands together for Mike. To the left of Mike we have Kevin Jones and Kevin Jones uh, joined the firm uh, 78 Correct. for Triumph as a, an apprentice and from there you moved over to, you became a part of uh, the Austin Rover organisation, ended up uh, in the press garage before moving over and uh, becoming a press officer. Life in PR. A life in PR from that point on and uh, Kevin is such a nice guy. Even today, he's been carrying my coats and opening the doors. <laughs> and I have to keep reminding him, you yeah. know, that you know we're not here on business; we're here for pleasure. And uh, but yeah, and absolutely. Hope it's never die. <laughs> and the the other thing I'd say about Kevin, he he is the guy that lent me my first ever press car. So back in two thousand and three, I I wrote a rather grovelling email to MG Rover and said. I've got this little site and it'd be really nice to review some of your cars. Please could I try your car? Kevin organised me an MGZ TV uh, for a week with a full tank of fuel. Man alive. I, I start, felt, at the, start at the bottom. <laughs> I felt like I'd arrived. Um, and this was probably the, just before the sad times as we all know. And I think you know Kevin won't mind me saying that he smiled through all of it. He smiled through the bad times. and. Uh, switched the lights out at the end of it, um, which uh, probably was a very emotional moment for, for Kevin. And I, I remember a couple of days after it all happened, I rang him up on his mobile phone and said, uh, how are you, Kevin? Are you OK? And he said, well, I, I'm OK. I'm, I'm just actually standing in the queue of uh, the job centre at the moment. Can I call you back? <laughs> uh, and I, and, and that, that moment really hit home. It, was, it felt like it was over at that point. And 6,000 employees at Longridge it was, it was quite a tough time. In fact, his arm was the first to be re-employed, was the good silver lining. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to the left of Kevin, we have Dennis Chick. Dennis has been part of the firm for a long time. He worked on Rover P7, uh, started out as an apprentice at the Rover, at the Rover company, moved over to British Leyland, and uh, had a stellar career, and, and ended up running uh, Director of Communications in the 1990s. This was the era when Rover was back. They had the R8, the, the 400, the 600, um, even the Metro. I mean, the Metro was a fabulous car in 1990, and that, again, is one of those stories of the engineers achieving the impossible. Um, so yeah, put your hands together for Dennis. <laughs> Last and certainly not least, we've got Ian Pogson here. Um, Ian is... Um, a guy who will just do anything to help anybody. Um, you cut him, he'll bleed. He'll bleed firm. He is absolutely a top guy. So Land Rover. Yes, starting off. Um, and BL Technology before that. After that. After, after that. that, sorry. Yeah. And went on to um, be one of the few guys that actually carried on working for the firm in the Chinese years and ended up working over in China. He's published a great book on the subject, which. Uh, I recommend anybody look up on uh, Amazon, you'll still be able to get it. Can you still get it? Yeah, carry on car making, yeah. Yeah, so please, please, please <coughs> have a look at that one. And Ian will tell you anything that you ask about TF um, and about any other product, basically. Um, so put your hands together for Ian. <laughs> so without further ado, what I'll do is I'll take some questions. 
So if you've got any questions for any of our guys here, please put up your hand. Steve. Sorry to intrude. Um, I, I'm busting to know this. What was Harold Musgrove really like? <laughs> Just think about the scenario that he was working in. Um, he, he started off in his younger days in the manufacturing operation. Um, he, his first big job, I suppose, was running the Bargoid plant down near Swansea, um, where they made the J40 pedal car, as many, mm -hmm. much as other things. And um, he, he, so he grew up in a, in a manufacturing environment, which is always a hardener for anybody. But in the period I was working with him, um, he was, of course, dealing with massive political issues. He was dealing with massive uh, issues with the unions. Um, the Red Robbo era was a real challenge for him and the organization. And uh, he was fighting like hell with Margaret Thatcher to get some money to build the K-Series engine when she said, no, go and buy a Peugeot engine, that's all you need. And he stuck his heels in and we got the money for the engine. So he was, he was, he was under a lot of pressure in that organization. A um, few little anecdotes. I was, when I was in product planning, I was responsible for, first of all, in product planning for parts, accessories, and rationalization. Wonderful title. That was my introduction to product planning. But I went on to look after TR7 and um, SD1 after that. But in the time I was doing that work on, on the parts side, I had a project to introduce stick-on badges to all the cars. You probably remember these things. We thought we'd drill, stop drilling holes in body panels that would rust instantly, and we'd stick them on instead. And I was making a presentation in the, um, in the Elephant House. There's another story comes into this as well. Um, and it was, it was a metro, metro presentation, final details on the metro design, and then this badging. I was on, on last with the badges. And it was my very first ever presentation to the board and the standing committee. And um, I'll start with the first story, which is not related to what I was going to say afterwards. But, that was the famous day when David Bache, who was the design director, Rover guy, responsible for all the brands in the organization, but hated working for niche stuff like Austin and Morris and things, you know, he was a Rover guy. And he, we were having a presentation on Metro and things were getting a bit heated about certain, certain designs, certain components on the car. And uh, Harold and he were having a very tough time uh, agreeing on something which Harold didn't agree with, that David wanted to push. And there had been, there had been a lot of winding up going on before this. He didn't like David Bache. Bache didn't like him. But I could see this was, this, there was going to be a crescendo here. And there was. It got heated, heated, heated. It blew up in the end. And Harold just banged the table and said, stop. And he beckoned Bache. And they went, we were in the elephant house, the round house at Longbridge, over into a corner office. And we could hear the conversation there was getting really, really quite loud. And it got louder and louder, and then suddenly went very quiet. And we thought, he's killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and the door opened, Beish walked out of the door, he walked straight across the middle of the studio, between us all, outside, got into his Tara Green Triumph stag, disappeared, and we never saw him again. And that was the fatal day that uh, Mr. Beish and he fell out terminally. Um, and then Harold kind of rubbed his hands and said, let's get on with the badges then, chick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's go on so I, let's I'm go making my presentation about the badges and I'm, 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 I'm pretty nervous. And after that thing that went on over the corner there, I was even more nervous. <laughs> you survived. And, well, halfway through the presentation, I did get something wrong, actually. I, I, I presented the wrong thing and I got the cost, the cost of the, of the programme. I think I put down to one badge instead of the whole programme, which was like four and six months for this whole stuff. You know, it was million pounds or something. Anyway, at the end, and he, he stopped me and he said, say that again, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, at the end of it, at the end of the presentation, last item, he walked off and he turned around and he caught my eye and he, he did this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'd come over here. Anyway, he took me into the, not the same office, but, <laughs> but he said, uh, he said, you up there, didn't you? And I said, yes, Harold, I did, I'm afraid. I, I, yes, I'm just a bit nervous, you know, for my first one. He said, look, he said, all part of growing up. He said, you need to remember blah, blah, blah. And he said, uh, tell you what, he said, um, come and see me at the end of the week and we'll have a chat about things. Anyway, I went to his office on the Friday and he became my mentor for about six months. We, had, we used to have a little chat every few weeks. His PA would call me up and he'd ask me what was going on, was I happy with so, what I was doing? And, and sort of thing, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and that was great for me. He was a really, really nice, kind granddad figure to me. 
but deadly serious. Um, but as I say, when you when you when you look at the background of what, what, the, the, what he was working in, the environment he was working in, he had a really really tough job to do. The very last day when he resigned um, over his other issues, his PA called me in and she said, "Harold wants to see you before he goes." So I went up to his office, and um, in his office, on a kind of big old offices, wooden panel walls and all this stuff, and a big, like a sideboard thing in the end. And on the top of the sideboard was a model of the Metro. And it was the model that was presented by BSM to Austin Rover of this, made by Bassett Loke. Big brass thing, beautiful. And uh, there was another one, I think, that was presented. They had two made, one was for Austin Rover, one was for BSM. And he said, he said, whenever you come up to my office, he said, you're always looking at that bloody model over there, he said. And I have to, you know, oi, chick. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm a bit worried about it. If I leave it here, it's going to get stolen. And he said, would you like it? And I said, what? What? Me? <laughs> he said, would you, he said, will you take it away, he said, because it'll get stolen. He said, go and put it in your car and take it home. Look after it for me. So I did. And then the next morning, Anne rang me and said, by the way, there's a nice album of photographs here by Bassett Loke about the manufacturer of the whole thing. Take it with you, take it with you. And I've got a little letter with his note on the saying, enjoy this model. And um, I've got it at home, and it will stay there until probably come here eventually. That's the kind of guy he was, and I, I had every respect for him in the way he was working, the environment he worked in. He was a lovely bloke. But, yeah, he didn't stand fools gladly at all. He, if, if, you, if you didn't work with him, not for him, with him, then you were on a hiding to nothing, I think. Um, you had to push, you had to push yourself and you had to give your five penna. And he was happy. Yeah, if you don't uh, And famously got the Phoenix Four. Say that one of you become the Phoenix Five on that fateful day. And you've got the hindsight now so you can lie through your teeth, but what would you have done differently or what would you have done better? I'm going to start with Kevin. Let's so you all going to go at that. Kevin was the fifth. Kevin was the fifth. Phoenix yeah, 5, number of course. Yeah. Where can I go with this? Um, it's Joel. Go with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Kevin, somebody go who uh, was at the gates to receive them after their successful acquisition. And to, you might probably know the story, but when John Edwards and his colleagues, uh, and you know, I'm talking about John Towers and uh, Nick Stevenson, they'd gone through the nights for 50 days or something, putting this plan together, they, they managed to extrude what became MG Rover Group uh, from uh, BMW <coughs> only because they knew that uh, the Alchemy proposal was going to ask BMW for another dowry on top of what was already been proposed. Um, so the guys took the business ahead uh, as a private enterprise because we still had possession of it in our minds as it being a public company. So they'd always got a, a job against them. Uh, as regards the questions and the hindsight that what they probably should have done is ring fenced a few good engineers, marketeers, and everything else, and reduced the company and kept that going and and allowed the rest to to fall over rather than all of us go down. Um, the DTI were sort of uh, playing things out carefully because they'd, they'd already uh, lost a, a bit of dignity from the uh, negotiations. Of, and they, they in, in a sense, they allowed this plane to to come into land and actually go through the floor and crash when it, was, it had the body of some great people, had lots of equity, just didn't have the finances. And we did everything to make sure that company was exciting and uh, a proposition going forward, but it was five or 6,000 people, as, as we've said, and that was too many to make it viable going forward. Those last five years were the hardest, but the most rewarding. So Dennis was sort of saying in a BL parallel way. We worked hard and we played hard, and to have had that experience and being at the forefront or in, in a leading part of it, it was just fantastic to see. It was really hard. I'd go to work every day thinking, have I got a job? Because you never knew what was going to blow over next week. Uh, it, was, it was thoroughly hard. It was, it was like an adrenaline junkie because I'd have a phone going one minute and my mobile going the next and I'd write press releases just by a sentence because I got so many interruptions. But I loved it. It was just such a thrilling place to be. It was traumatic. It took me a year to get over that uh, situation. I was lucky enough to get a job pretty much straight away. Um, but you, you, uh, I had a lot of time for the Phoenix Four, greed aside, <laughs> but it was their company. Why wouldn't they have protected themselves? They didn't have a pension, so they'd tell you. Um, but uh, but I, still, I still don't think it would have worked any other way, and I do think what they did was good and allowed us to, to have the fun. They built that company. It's just a shame that the Chinese couldn't see the value in that at the crucial time. When you were looking at 
selling a vehicle. If you're selling a vehicle off the peg, i.e. standard car, standard colour, then yes, you know where they are. But, but with, with, with Rovers, and especially with 600s and 800s, when they got a little bit posher, people used to like to put their stamp on it, and they want optional extras or fancy colours and, and, and this, that, and the other. Now, you, you, in, the, in the BMW era, you would, you, would, you would take the order from the customer, and that would be, that would be, um, that would be then put forward, and you would be aiming to look for uh, 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 an estimated date of arrival of the car. In the BMW era, if you say you wanted a, an 800 and a certain shade of this with that fitted in it and that radio instead of this, and you, you put the line of communication in, you get back, oh, I don't know, oh, I don't know, I don't know when we can do that. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell the customer standard, standard 90 days, three months. And a lot of the time, a British car built in a British company, the customers wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't take to that whatsoever. Now then, Selling the car in the, in the Phoenix era was brilliant because the line of communication went from being a bowl of spaghetti to as close as where you are. Mm. So you as the salesman, and I was lucky because I worked in a Phoenix operated dealership in, in, in the latter part of it, we would pick up the phone and we'd literally dial a Birmingham number <laughs> and speak to some guy in the, in the, in the roundhouse. Uh, uh, where, were the, where was the odd plan offices where sales and marketing with Opposite You put a line through and you say, right, I want a 45 in... I was going to say my old, my old oh, car. Yeah. Well, a 75 in, in, in Moonstone Green, the guy wants this up, this up, this up, the other. Um, yeah, uh, we'll look into that, we'll get back to you in five minutes. You put the phone down, you take the customer, would you like another? Oh, yes, please. And you get a phone call through, yeah, we can choose. They could adapt to change. We, so, we got good at ordering parts. So, yeah, this is the interesting <laughs> that's that's one. One. We So quickly. The, it, it, came from, it came from being part of a, 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 a massive company that you, you, you felt that um, you didn't know why they were there, BMW, to, 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 a, small, to a smaller business that you yeah, actually felt part of it. Yeah. yeah. There, was, there was stories of when they were uh, bringing out the facelift of 75, for, for, for example, how not well perceived it may have been. Who was I was talking to about German engineers and British engineers? Was it you, John? Was it, was it, was it, was, there was somebody I was talking to while you were on outside. Yes, and in the BMW way, all the BMW guys, when it was five o'clock, they would go home. <laughs> that would be it. And they'd be gone. Half past five, bang, clocked out, gone. And you would hear stories of guys working at Longbridge or whatever at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Not necessarily getting paid for it, neither, because they had that much passion and a bit of fire burning in their belly to, to get the job done. So they've been out till two, three o'clock in the morning. I mean, stories about getting a seventy-five V eight to uh, stopping the tramping. Mm -hmm. There were stories of making their own pits and climbing underneath them while cars were wheel spun, just to try and figure this thing out. And, and what stories of them? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but to, to, to enable you to ask, ask some more questions, I, I will say one thing about the Phoenix Four, and, and certainly about uh, with respect to John Towers, who was kind of like the main man, if you like, who, who took a, a hands-off approach. I do recall being in the Birmingham area at the time, in 2000, and listening to the, the legend that used to be Ed Doolan. Mm. It used to be on a morning from nine till, nine till midday with his consumer show on Radio WM. And it was literally five minutes after it all happened, it had all been agreed, yep, 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 and the pictures were there with him having his glass of champagne. I remember him talking to Ed Doolan on the programme where he came out with a very interesting thing very early on that in their defence or rather in Tower's defence has never been publicised and I absolutely remember him saying we are nothing without a collaborative partner. Exactly. And he said that in 2000, he said we are nothing, he said looking for, because even du du Doolan, Doolan's just a journalist, he doesn't understand the motor industry. He said, looking forward, you know, where do you need to be and, 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 and what, where do we go from here? And Towers said, and I remember listening in the car that day, and he effectively said, moving forwards without a collaborative partner, we are nothing. And unfortunately, five years down the line, that came to be, despite the cause. I worked from 1980 for Land Rover, BL Technology, then Land Rover itself, then through into Rover Group, then at Long Bridge from 95 on, and I stayed there virtually through the Chinese state to the end, for me anyway, 2015. Um, and to me, I have had a privileged career. I have worked with some of the greatest 
brains on this planet, not just automotive brains. Um, and uh, worked with some fantastic product, but tragically worked on some very, very old factories. Now, I don't know what the figure is, maybe you guys can remember it, but just to open the door of Longridge cost one of these and, and one of these. So it was really expensive because it was old. Yeah. Yet, if you look at Nissan or Honda or Toyota, all of them were given ground that was flat, that yeah. was expandable, that had services, that had modern this and modern that. And we were working at the top of Heart Attack Hill in some cases. <laughs> it was literally called Heart Attack Hill, the road from Engate up to the, the, the cabs. And, and the transportation of bodies from, say, Westworks up through the paint shop, through Southworks and all that, was costly on its own. So your cost base to start off with was just ridiculously high. Heating old buildings and propping up old equipment. I put a lot of new equipment into the factory. I was part of my job in manufacturing engineering in the mid-90s. Um, and some of the old equipment I had to replace, some of it had Air Ministry badges on it. <laughs> when I was a foreman in the early 80s at Perry Bar running spiral bevel diffs uh, manufacture, crown wheels and pinion, I'd got War Ministry washing machine I got rain coming through the roof that hadn't got any glass in it. Um, the whole place needed bulldozing. Land Rover, for, 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 for an example on its own, had 13 satellite factories, including Pengam at Cardiff, which made a fabulous gear on. Um, and Bargoid, which made fabrications as well as the, the petrol cars and all sorts of things. So, 13 satellite plants for a low volume 4x4 manufacturer was entirely ridiculous. So the sensible thing to do was unweld the doors that had been welded shut in Eastworks in, in Solid Hall and put all of those factories in there. But all of those factories were little family companies, Percy Road, Perry Bar, 200, 250 people, they all got their own factory manager, his secretary, some new finance, tool room and machine to repair, did all the bits to make a factory work. But what the big mistake we made there and this is very typical of, of, of the company, is to completely underestimate the culture of what was then going to go into an empty building. So you've got all these microcultures of the, these 13 plants going into this empty vacuum, and they didn't give them anything to sort of hang the hat on, and, and you know, this is the way, like Nissan would do. Right, if you've worked in the automotive industry before, so a gentleman here works at Nissan, um, we probably don't want you because of the baggage you bring with you. That was their view, which was an entertaining view. Um, so we did lots of mistakes like that, but still throughout all of that, you st were still working with some of the greatest people. When we used to meet here, people come from up from Cowley, they come down from Solly or from Cowley, and you'd meet people. There was 40,000 people of this thing when I joined in. Massive, but all with its individual and this comes through all the time, that's why we're here. Passion. Now, passion is great if it's directed. If it's, you're married and it's directed at your wife, that's okay. <laughs> but if, and John Towers would fill you in on this one, if it's, or Mrs. Towers would, if it's directed at some other woman, it gets kind of dodgy. So passion <laughs> needs directing. And these guys are past masters at it because you know, that's, that's what they had to engender in the public. Um, so when you got your Triumphs and your Rovers and, and the passions for those, which were right, but then when you brought it all together, it, it gets, like Dennis said, yeah, heated discussions in the corners <laughs> with two good people. You know, they were both right in their own way, I suppose. You know, Beige was brilliant. Musgrove brought his case series and loads of other things. So yeah, it, it's, it's, John Towers, I would follow down a dark cul-de-sac because I believed in it. Mm -hmm. I remember one day at Solihull, we announced the Discovery One, first Discovery, to the workforce. So some of us had seen it and knew quite a bit about it because I was involved in you know, a very edge of it. Uh, edge of it. Um, but when we were all in the, in the social club at the, the back of Solihull site there, and um, 
and, and the car came on the stage, there was grown men crying, crying. These were, you know, people off the track, hard people that I'd worked with, because I've worked a lot in production, there's some hard noses out there, a lot of theatre too. Um, and uh, people just spontaneously jumping up and applauding because we'd found a way out. We'd found a new product because we'd just had you know, old Range Rover Classic and we had the, the what became Defender. Um, and he was something new and different. And we, you know, it's the front end of a Range Rover from the Apex 4 mm -hmm. um, and much of the underneath. So, yeah, so I would follow John down a, a dark alley. Um, these days, I'd like to have a pint with him. I really would, in a rational, sensible way, and, and ask him. From, from a business point of view, obviously we had relatively new platforms in 25, 45, 75, so the Rover brand was fairly safe, if not you know, on its own path, uh, as luxury and things. But for MG, it could grow. So it seems obvious now, doesn't it? But to have had an MGR, uh, ZR, ZS and ZT was obvious. The TF was a fantastic, the best faces of any car I yeah. think has ever been. It's just a great experience that car. But the, the brief was to build a staircase to heaven. And so it might be a romantic thing, but you know, we, we, we had a situation where uh, Cavalli, I was at Le Mans in 2001 when Cal Cavalli was brought over, invited over, and they bought the company. Now that was so that you know, they could have their play, but it was also a serious proposition. And after Peter had done a second wind of, after 9-11 with X80, uh, and made it into the aggressive car it was. It's, it's a very attractive car. I've got one in the next road to me, and it still looks flipping fantastic, you know, 15 years on. What I was going to say was, sorry, but, um, you know, we had, we had the ability to do most sports, so we put some sex appeal into the brand, and it was great to live that. I mean, for one minute I was doing flipping rallying one minute, touring cars the next, and touring them on. It was fantastic. <coughs> There was an awful lot going on, but there had to be because we got partners. We got uh, Nick Stevenson that had come out of, and I forget, just as I'm talking about it, sorry, um, Alola. So we got this car, and they wanted something for their time. We got a Le Mans car, it's great, but it did seem to everybody we were doing too much too quickly. And the hospitality budget was more than Audi, wasn't it, sadly? No, it wasn't. We had, we had the Porsche <laughs> Curves, <laughs> it looked like it, and, but no, it wasn't Audi budget, I'll tell you. No. <laughs> Because you had, you had bugger all back up, you had bugger all spare. But we, you had we, loads, we, of, we, loads of pretty John girls. John Towns drink. Awesome. For every pound you spend, I want one pound fifty's worth of value from yeah. it. And that drove us. Everything we did, it wasn't done on the cheap, it was done on the clever. Oh, right. And, and we didn't have the budget, so we just had to maximise it. And that was half the fun of it. It wasn't easy, but we didn't have to get some excitement from getting more for our money. And we, we spent wisely. And God, they didn't have to capitalise it at, on the dealership level. Oh yeah, which is a complete polar opposite to how it's gone with 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 MG6 and all that. Mm. Where, yes. where at best, all they were doing to capitalise was sticking a couple of cars outside the Tesco supermarket on a Saturday. But we also knew that the customer yeah. was king, and the customer needs race, race on race. Sunday, sell on Monday, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask each of you what your favourite firm product is, um, and, I'm, and I'm going to try and limit it to one minute. So I'll start with Mike. All right. 200, 400 R8, just because apart from the later ones when they had gas starting to go wonky on them, they were just a straight out of the box car and it, it just showed that uh, with the right ingredients what, uh, what Rover could do with their input and it, uh, it distanced themselves from all the tripe that they'd been building before. Kevin? It's a very broad question. Uh, there wasn't a car I launched that I wouldn't put the name to, but if you imply the car that I most enjoyed as my personal car, it would be an RA3 door. Now this came along when A, there was a, some of a slight body kit front bumper, we also had I think an RSP roll bar or something, but that car looked the business. I've never ever driven a car since that went round the corner so well. Uh, so that would be my car, that has been red as well. Cool. And also apparently Russ Swift says the best handbrake in any car I've ever driven. Even the Montego. <laughs> Even the Montego. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis. Based on the first car I ever worked on, which was a P6 2000, when I've got a nice TC, um, I will go for the 75 because that brought back to me the core, proper British engineering kind of feel. You know, the engineers there who designed a vehicle to do a job using their nows, being sophisticated. Um, and we, I know we had BMW underneath the Rover 75, but that BMW's engineering 
what took me back to the days of rover engineering, proper, true excellence in engineering. And that car, now I've got a 75, which is, I just love driving it because it says to me everything that rover always did say before it got consumed by, by the rest of the organization, but it popped up again right at the end in the 75 for me, so it's a 75. Yeah. Um, because I was the last chief engineer, I'm tempted to say the TF, but that's kind of a love-hate relationship <laughs> because it was so cheaply done. So I'd go, um, not one better than Dennis, but I'd go ZTT because I just love that car. And MG ZTT, and it, I'm sorry, it just have to have a V8 in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So if everybody what, wants to... What's yours? Mine? Oh it's, my goodness, I didn't think anyone would ask me that. Really uh, this uh, SD1. Yeah. Yeah. SD1. I know there's people who worked in the company who spoke to me uh, about the SD1 project who said it was actually a bit of a white elephant because the amount of money spent on it, because it kind of consumed money that should have been spent on other projects. But it was just a beautiful thing. Um, and it was so cleverly engineered and it was so far ahead of the opposition when it was launched that it just blew everything away. So I'd go with the SD1. Interesting quick observation on that one. The team that worked on that car was disappointed in the, th the fact that the, we got this massive team of Ford cost control engineers came in just before that car started engineering. And we just said it was a Rover Ford Cortina underneath. A very nice, sophisticated Ford Cortina. A glorious, <laughs> a glorious Ford <laughs> So we'll take five minutes.